So here's the fun part for me. Um, I spent a lot of my time working, I used to spend a lot of my time actually, working on data. And data from NASA, data from MIT, it's almost total chaos. You're looking at random things happening, trying to figure out what it is and make some sense out of it. Well, plastic to oil is actually about as close to chaos as you can get. And then really, like anything else, it's managing it. And so that's what our P2O rollout is about. That's what I saw in April from it. Uh, and I'll go right into the slides, and I'm going to try and explain uh, and go beyond a bit more about really where we've been and, how we're, and, and where we're going with it and how we got there. And I hope to, you to leave with an understanding of what exactly we're doing and uh, from there really how to scale it out and grow it fairly quickly. The first thing that was important was we had this wonderful uh, concept back in April. I was researching a tape archive for an oil and gas client of ours, Addicts Petroleum. And I was looking up seismic data on my massive archive, trying to understand well log formats, seismic data formats, everything in oil and gas I really didn't know anything about. And so fortunately, with every other search in our own in-house engineering archive, we found uh, a very, I found a very interesting document that had uh, some information about a catalyst to break down plastic. Basically, it wasn't used to convert plastic into diesel, but I'd recalled back years before when I was at the legislature when, when basically the large uh, bottle companies had lobbied the government to go all plastic and, and remove basically the, return, the returnable bottles, basically eliminate glass. So they created this huge plastic problem, and we all knew there that it had become a huge disaster, and sure enough, it has. It didn't take very long, too. It took about less than 10 years, really, to create a huge mess. So the first thing was is I found this paper, and we had to get a little machine, which I'll explain in a minute, but it was how do you build something like this quickly? So we obviously had to go to the public markets for it. I don't like venture capital. I don't like the way they take, uh, they take a, a small company and they basically get it on an exchange fairly quickly with limited financing, pump up the stock, their people exit, and you're left with a CEO, some cash, and a company that's barely operable. I see it all the time, all kinds of startups that come up. You see them on the market, they go up and they crash. I wanted to avoid that. So we started this differently. The first thing was get public through a, uh, a public shell and then bring in retail investors. Let's make people here, and many of you are here today, who are investors in that company at some level. So you've become the funds of what we're trying to do. And so the second part of it really was, we had access to this huge data archive that we have back in the uh, late 90s. While everyone else was watching the dot-com stock boom, I was all over the country buying up computer systems from every university and factory I possibly could. I bought their tape archives. I bought their computers, and then I ended up flipping and selling them to the uh, deep pocket founders of the Fortune, basically the Fortune 100 technology companies. This happened in the year 2000. Through that process, these founders wanted to access their original data and relive the nostalgia of their university years. So I had to develop a, a, an engine basically capable of transferring the, or basically migrating the data that they saved back in the 60s and be able to read it in modern formats. And with that, we built a huge archive and really a, an engine to be able to manage this old data. And it continued to grow and grow and grow. And to date, there's somewhere around 50 million documents in it, all the way through from the 60s, through the start of the internet, all the way through to 93, 95, and so forth. And so it was really taking all of that and then, and then building, uh, really building this plastic toil idea we've had and using the information research I found and test to see if it's good. So the first thing was, I, I, I looked, searched the internet for something that would simulate uh, a, a small little processor. We could just test the catalyst in our concepts. And we found the company Blessed in Japan. They're not doing well. The, the product makes you know, a kind of a slurry type fuel. Its energy return is poor. And it, isn't, you know, it, it has no real practical commercial purposes. But for us, on a lab unit, and a way to test in a kind of safe way, with, as you can see, a, a, a basically a visual indicator here, this little glass column with water in it, it gave us basically a little mini refinery to test our process in. So Alan Barnett and I, I went out and I bought the catalyst. We mixed it up. Of course, you know, I, I don't have a lot of expertise in chemistry, so I learned as we went along and didn't mix it right, but that was a good thing. It worked out well. Uh, <laughs> 
And so when I showed Alan all this, and Alan Barnett is our chemist, he looked at me and went, this can't work, because if it, if it worked, everyone would be doing it. So, well, I said, well, let's try it. So we put it inside this processor with a bunch of different plastics, and lo and behold, we had fuel coming out. And we learned as we changed various operating parameters inside this machine, we modified it extensively, we could adjust the kind of fuel output we were getting. And so Alan then built this, uh, he added a nitrogen purge, so we'd stop getting gassed from it when we were trying to load it. He, he uh, built a little feeder, that little gray thing on top. Eventually we limited the, little gl the glass column because one of the things that we felt when while we were testing the small process was, we were sending out our fuel to be sampled, but we thought we've got to be adding water to the fuel because it's, our condenser here essentially was just bubbling the uh, hydrocarbon gas through water. So Alan then redesigned the unit and built, a, uh, built his own condenser, and guess what? We weren't adding any water to the fuel. Actually, we get 0.0% water in our fuel. And the second thing was, we didn't have any sediment. So then we went beyond this and went, wow, this is a really good thing. And there it is again, that's the, uh, that's the, the basic condenser and the basic system that Alan did and, and modified. From there, we said, we've got to analyze this better. So we went out and bought a gas chromatograph. Iolchem has hundreds of these, we have one. So we started, we built a small little oil and gas lab here in Niagara Falls. And we, 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 Alan processed the output of our machine so we could better understand the kind of fuel we were processing. And from that, what I want to do right now is to really show you what it is we're doing. This is what I would call polymer cracking. And in its simplest forms, and at the highest possible level, what I'm showing you at the top line here is what plastic is. It's a hydrocarbon chain and very long. And what you have to do is when you heat it up, and in the right conditions, you can crack it and you're cracking it into smaller lengths. The smaller the length, the lighter the fuel. So you're starting with anything with C1 to C4 is natural gas. You get that all at home, that's what runs your furnaces and heats your homes in the winter. Anything beyond that, between five and nine, you're looking at gasoline, beyond 10, you're at diesel, then you're heading into anything over 20 is really wax, and then you get into heavy fuels, and then what I call the slurry and slop that you really don't want. That's the, uh, that's the heavy products. What's interesting about polymer cracking, and what I've learned a lot about organic chemistry is, it's chaos. So it's a random result. So basically, if you took a machine right now and you heated up plastic, you would randomly get some gas, some natural gas, a lot of wax, and a it looks like a slurry, really, in the end. So what we had to do first, and with our blessed unit, is we designed a small unit that could take the long hydrocarbon chains in, the plastic, the shredded plastic, heat it up, and then convert it into these smaller chains. And more importantly, how do we control it in such a way that we get the kind of fuel we want? And that's not so easily done. So here again, the long hydrocarbon plastic chain, I'm showing you the length of what diesel would look like in gasoline. This is generally what you're getting in random hydrocarbon cracking. Really, this is when you just take your plastic, your polyethylene, you throw it in the machine, you heat it up the way you see many, of, you see many sites uh, that come up and down. They say, oh, we're doing plastic to oil. They produce about 10% gasoline, 20% diesel, and 70% slop. And it's useless. It's like, a, it's like a, a waxy substance. All the fuel basically permeates it, and this is what you're stuck with. It's not sellable. Refineries don't like it, and it's difficult to work with. It doesn't flow at all, so it's a nightmare to try and even transport from your machine to tank. What we did was something a bit different. We took our catalyst and our operating parameters, and again, we were running a uh, fairly, uh, a fairly uh, I would almost call it a backyard chemistry lab. We had a lab, we had a chemist, but we didn't have the kind of technology really at that time that Iolchem had to give us the expertise we needed to take it to the next level. But what we did know from our lab test was is that we can produce 8% natural gas out of our process. We can consistently produce about 15% gasoline, 75% diesel, and this was the coolest part, 0.02% of any long chains. So that's your wax. Very, very little. And less than 2% residue. Could I get a drink, please? Thanks. It's going to be a...